Good evening and welcome to the May 13th Maplewood City Council meeting. Uh, tonight, before we get started, I wanted to highlight something that is very important that is happening in our community uh, by tomorrow. Uh, and that is the vote on the school bond referendum. Uh, if you watched our council meeting, I think two council meetings ago, we had Superintendent Osario come to the council during a workshop and she presented uh, the bond referendum that is being presented to our community. And if you are interested in getting more information, you can certainly go on the uh, ISD 622 website and learn. You can actually see the, uh, the presentation that she did for our council. She's got a great uh, PowerPoint uh, filled with all sorts of information, but it is a really important bond referendum, and I wanted to open up our meeting with it because uh, for any of you who have students out there uh, or care about students in our schools, you know that our schools really need physical work. There are some of the schools in our school district that haven't been touched really for about 50 years. Uh, I was at uh, Weaver Elementary uh, just last week for the leadership uh, day along with a number of staff members, uh, people from uh, uh, Commander Shortreed, City Manager um, Coleman, a uh, number of officers were there as well, Lieutenant Karate, uh, and Weaver School looks exactly the same as when my, my sons went to school there, and they are 29 and 27. And so this bond referendum is a little bit different in that it is only to be used for the physical uh, building themselves. And it's not very often that, you know, I, I talk about how I vote other than when I'm here at the council, and then everyone knows how I vote. Uh, but I'm going to vote in favor of this, and this is really crucial to the future of our schools. I've been talking to a lot of members of the community about it, and one of the things that I have been bringing up to people is that do you realize how important that is? It's not just spending money uh, without some kind of a result. Uh, I know that the city meets with realtors. We talk with realtors uh, and the school district, and really our home values, uh, whether or not young families, uh, whether or not people with kids want to move to our community has to do with our schools. And our schools need some love. And this bond referendum, I think, is going to go a long way to ensuring that there is a bright future for our students, and I'm certainly supporting it. Now, we've had early voting uh, up until now, and tomorrow I'm going to ask uh, our city clerk, Sint, where can people go and vote tomorrow? Uh, and I'm encouraging people to vote in favor of this bond referendum. Thank you, Mayor, Council. So tomorrow is election day for this special election. And the residents of Maplewood, um, and the reason I'm specifying Maplewood is because North St. Paul residents are going to be voting as well as some Washington County residents, and they have different rules. But for Maplewood, you go to your actual polling location for election day. Um, a little caveat on that, Precinct 4, they, people will want to check where their actual polling place is because three of the precincts have new polling locations. Um, so Precinct 4 will be going to Wakefield building, so that is the first time there. We're very excited to see how that sets up. Um, Precinct 10 is going to be going to the East Metro Training Facility, again another new place. And then um, the precinct that used to be at Gethsemane will be at Beaver Lake Elementary. But um, if they have any questions, they can go to the precinct finder on the Secretary of State to be able to know where they are going, where they need to go. But that is for tomorrow. Okay, tomorrow is it? Cast your votes, folks. So, uh, Council Member Juniman, you wanted to say something? Yes, thank you. Even though I live in the Roseville district, um, I'm still in Maplewood, and we passed a referendum last fall that was very similar to this. And you can drive around our district now and see them working on the buildings. And all you do and need to do is you need to go look at those pictures that the uh, superintendent brought in here and then realize that these buildings haven't been updated. And we're talking about everything from not proper ventilation bad heating, some of these buildings have asbestos that have to be removed, some of them don't have proper security because there's no way to enforce it. I mean, if they cut through somebody's office temporarily now, I mean, this is important stuff for your kids. So as, even though I voted yes in mine last November and I'm already seeing the, the fruits of it going on, you're gonna have the same opportunity tomorrow and I would certainly encourage it. 
Thank you. And with that, we have a, we're going to move to our Pledge of Allegiance. We have a volunteer. Do you want to step up to our microphone? And if you want to move down the microphone a little bit, please. There you go. Okay, can you tell us your name, please? Jordan Bierneman. Hello, Jordan. How are you? I know why you're here tonight. <laughs> okay, would you like to lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance, please? I pledge of allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, Jordan. That was very nice. City Clerk Sint, would you do a roll call for us, please? Councilmember Smith? Here. Councilmember Knudsen? Here. Councilmember Juneman? Here. Councilmember Neblet? Here. Mayor Abrams? Here. Thank you. Approval of the agenda. Do I have a motion? I move approval of the agenda. Second. <clears throat> Moved by. Juneman, second by Smith. Any further discussion? Councilmember Juneman. Two uh, council presentations. Okay. The uh, Bergeron Memorial Awards and the city cleanup. Councilmember Smith. I'd like to give a brief update on the Gold Line project. Okay. And I would like to add Leadership Day at Weaver School. Anything else, council members? Okay, all those in favor of the agenda? Aye. 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 Okay, moving on to approval of the minutes. The April 22nd, 2019 City Council Workshop Minutes. I move approval. Second. second. Moved by Juneman, seconded by Knudsen. Approval of the April 22nd, 2019 City Council Workshop Minutes. Uh, any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Motion passes. Uh, the City Council meeting minutes for April 22nd. Do I have a motion for that? So moved. Second. Moved by Neblet, seconded by Knudsen, I mean by Juneman, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> by Juneman. Uh, any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Motion passes. Uh, appointments and presentations, administrative presentations. City Manager Coleman, our council calendar update. Uh, thank you, Mayor Abrams. The uh, council calendar is just a, a opportunity for us to preview what's coming up on um, upcoming council workshops and council meetings, and also to talk about particular projects that might be of interest to the council that we're working on on their behalf. Um, our next meeting is May 28th, that's a Tuesday. We're gonna have at the workshop a presentation from Ellers and Associates. They're our financial consultants, and they're going to talk about an analysis of our Gladstone redevelopment plan and really where we're at and where we think we're going and how we're going to get there financially. So it'll be a really good workshop for the council. On June 10th at the workshop, we'll start looking at the 2020 to 2025 capital improvement plan. This is where the council uh, targets funds to do all of our major expenditures and projects, our street projects. Um, all of our capital equipment that we have to buy, that kind of thing, and we look out five years. We're also going to hear about the North End study uh, update. And at the council meeting, we're going to have the Nature Center master plan back before the city council, and that will be after an open house on May 23rd, which will be held at the Wakefield, our new Wakefield community building, I think from 5.30 to 7.00. Sorry, Audra, put you on the spot. No, that open house is actually at the Nature Center, and it's oh, from 6 to 7.30. Okay, yep. thank you. Um, on June 24th, uh, we will have several uh, workshop items, including a review of the administrative department. We're, as we're gearing up to uh, get into the 2020 budget, it's our practice to bring in each of the departments to talk about the work that they do and just a preview of some of the things that they're looking at into the future for next year so that the council becomes aware of what the departments are working on as we get through the budget process. We're also going to visit the pet licensing program that we have and we'll be talking more about our communications plan. Uh, and their de department presentation. We're working on a few items for the council. We're going to be scheduling Tobacco 21, 
uh, that will be coming up soon. I wanted just to note that the tree program uh, that we started, there'll be tree pickup on May 18th and also on May 20th at the City Hall campus up the hill at the 1902 building in the parking lot behind there. Um, so that is a result of an idea that came from the City Council on looking at other cities' programs. Uh, we're also looking at um, pet licenses as scheduled, and we are just finishing up the Board and Commission interview review process, or process review. And one of the things that the council asked me to do was to check in with the boards and commissions about the whole interview process when we interview for new members. And I do have some feedback that I'll be sharing with you. I would also uh, note that we have, uh, with regard to rental licensing program, we're considering adopting a rental licensing program in the city of Maplewood. We have met with property owners several times. Um, and on the 15th, um, which is, I guess, this Wednesday night, uh, we'll be having an open house from 5.30 to 7.30 in which we've invited our renters in the city. I think we targeted about 800 uh, residents. And so we'll see what kind of outcome we get with that. So those are some of the key things going on. In addition to that, on uh, the 15th in the morning, we also have our business education series, and that's at 7.30 to 9.30 going to be, I think, on HR issues. It's with the St. Paul Area Chamber of Commerce, and that's at the MCC. Uh, why? And with that, Mayor, uh, I don't have any other items unless the council has some ideas or issues that they'd like to bring forward for staff to look at. Council, do you have any other suggestions for the city manager? Mm -hmm. okay. Thank you. Then moving on to council presentations, Council Member Juniman. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, first of all, on May 1st, another dreary, cold, rainy morning, <laughs> we um, gathered to remember Sergeant Joseph Bergeron, our officer who fell on the line of duty nine years ago. And first of all, I'd like to thank all the people who came. There was a very nice outpouring of people. It was very nice to be together with everyone. But it was a particularly special this year because um, the Public Safety Department and the, the family has come up with a wonderful, I think, program, the Joel, Sergeant Joel Bergeron uh, Memorial Community Awards. And every year they will award um, a member of the personnel here at the city and another one to a citizen. And this year the officer award went to um, Alicia Murtry, who recently retired for all of her um, outreach into the community through the years when she worked for our department. And then the, I loved the, award to the um, citizen because he was so overwhelmed. Tom Eaton, who has, I understand, um, <laughs> volunteered for over four years in the police department. But Mayor, may I ask the, the chief to address how what this man did for the for the police department? Mayor, can I talk, call on the Go chief? Ahead. Thank you. Mayor, members of the council, uh, Mr. Eaton uh, was a, a community volunteer that came in and one of those people that retired but still wanted to do things that were purposeful and meaningful. And so uh, he did uh, exactly um, everything that we ever asked him to do, quite frankly. Um, thousands of hours of volunteer service and everything from restocking supplies in our squad cars to washing uh, squad cars to bringing them up for service. Um, helping us to prepare for community events. Um, just an extremely active volunteer, uh, a wonderful uh, person to have around the police department, uh, the person who uh, his presence always kind of helped to lift the spirits of those around him. Uh, he uh, more recently has suffered some medical setbacks and so he's not able to volunteer in the way that he once did. But um, we uh, were very blessed to have him and continue to have him as a volunteer in the police department. Thank you, Chief. And there's going to be a plaque up here in the city council chambers each year with the names of the recipients of these awards. So you can come and look at that. It was very, very nice. And secondly, we had another event, not nearly as nice, but you know, it was necessary. This past Saturday, thank you to the heavens that we did not have the rain they had originally forecasted. We had our city annual city cleanup, and I don't have any numbers yet, but we had quite a few cars. I know it was well over 300, and people just find the darndest things in their garages and basements and <laughs> hiding under the beds and whatever else. Um, lots of things came and the, many people come and take advantage of the free shredding. So lots of people had back seats full of documents that they wanted to get rid of. And every year it, I think it's quite successful and I appreciate the fact that city staff t spends a great amount of time uh, not only putting it together but then 
putting it out there for us. Uh, Sean Finwall from uh, Community Development uh, has lucky here. She's become the <laughs> point person. And then she had lots of help from police reserves and our public works people and some of our parks people. Takes a lot of setup, a lot of time. And, but it was very successful once again. So if you missed it this year, you have to put on your calendar for next spring. Because in the fall now, we do not do that anymore. We have special rates on pickup of bulk items at the curb. But you miss an event if you weren't there Saturday because there was lots of stuff. So remember that when your garage is looking kind of bulgy next February, you'll be able to unload it. And I certainly want to acknowledge uh, we had 100% city council uh, representation out there, uh, checking in people and directing people on where to go. And it really was a fun event. And I have to say that staff did a fabulous job organizing all of that. You know, such details. We even, we had, uh, you know, some food and some, some beverages uh, and, and uh, even wet wipes for people. I mean, uh, you know, Sean thought of everything, napkins that went along with the pizza. It was, uh, staff did a really nice job kind of pulling that whole thing together. Small little details to make it a, a real success. And I think a lot of people, I know there were a lot of people there, so. We collected a fair amount of food for the food shelf as we well. We did too, a lot of food for the food shelf. That was great. So Council Member Smith, you wanna talk about the gold line? Thank you, Mayor. Um, we had uh, last week uh, our um, uh, uh, corridor management committee meeting and uh, exciting meeting. Uh, so the gold line's been in process for nearly 20 years, I think. <laughs> um, it's been some time uh, that this has been uh, a vision for the East Metro to have uh, our first real East Metro dedicated transit line. And uh, we took a vote as a committee uh, at that meeting to make the final recommendations for the funding for the application of the federal New Start program. So it was it was a huge milestone, very exciting. Um, so the uh, we took two actions. One was uh, to update our, our current estimates based on the current scope of the project. Um, you have to do that from time to time because of inflation and. Uh, as you get further in the project, you understand better what those costs are actually gonna be, so you need to make sure that you're updating those estimates. And then we took a second action to actually add several um, elements to the project officially, uh, three of which are really critical for Maplewood. Uh, one is a um, uh, pedestrian bridge over McKnight to link uh, between 3M and Sunray. Uh, and the other are uh, around Century Avenue, one is uh, to have a pedestrian bridge over Century um, to link 3M to Landfall, and then also uh, pedestrian improvements under the Century Avenue 94 bridge to be able to walk from, um, uh, from the south side of 94 and north side of 94 safely. Uh, those are all critical connections for us to have um, for people to be able to safely use this uh, throughout Maplewood. We only have one stop in Maplewood on this line, so we gotta make it count. Uh, so it's very exciting. Um, we've also had some good progress working with 3M recently on uh, how we're going to be partnering with them as far as providing access to the station. So that's exciting as well. So things are going great on the gold line and um, really excited to uh, get ground broken. I think 2022 we're looking at for an open in 2024. Exciting times mm -hmm. for transportation yeah. with Maplewood. Critical for these metro. Yeah. I wanted to highlight the Leadership Day and call out Weaver Elementary School. Uh, I even brought my folder. Uh, the entire school studied a, a whole, um, yeah, Stephen Covey, uh, the uh, seven successful traits of, of, uh, of how would of highly effective people, thank you very much. Uh, I could probably name seven because they were playing games with us to remember those. Uh, but anyway, it was uh, quite a wonderful opportunity and Weaver School is doing amazing things. Each one of the guests was welcomed by, I had a little kindergartner who introduced herself, told, her, told me that she was very glad that I was there, uh, and uh, welcome to Weaver School. It was really quite wonderful. Uh, and then we had a program, 
And we walked around, and I have to say I had a lot of fun with Mrs. Cluck's third grade class uh, actually applying the seven traits of highly successful people. And uh, Weaver School is doing just an amazing job, so I wanted to call that out. Uh, it was really fun, and I would encourage council members uh, next year, this time they will do it again. It's really fun to see how the school just embraces it. Every single grade participates uh, in levels that I was really astounded to see. Uh, very, very, uh, very cool. Uh, council members, I forgot to add one thing on the council presentations, and that's our potholes. Uh, you know, we kind of have an, epidem an epidemic <laughs> with our potholes, and uh, I have to say that right now, looking at the number of emails that I get, there are so many emails and phone calls that I get from residents. And what I said was I would actually talk about it a little bit during tonight, and this is the time. So if you're listening, we hear what you're saying about potholes. And I talked with city manager uh, um, Coleman this morning about it, and I'm gonna ask her if she would kind of discuss what our future plans are, what staff is doing from their perspective, because the council certainly hears what you are telling us, and we certainly see it as we're driving around the community, we know that we have a road issue and we're trying to tackle it. So City Manager Coleman, can you explain that? Yeah, thank you, Mayor Abrams, uh, members of the City Council. Um, I will tell you that um, Public Works Director Steve Love and our Finance Director Ellie Paulseth have been working very diligently on trying to solve the problem of how do we find enough funds to address all the street issues that we have. Um, they've come up with some good ideas. One of the things on the consent agenda tonight is looking for some additional funds to buy more bituminous uh, surfacing to do some more spot repair work uh, that's needed in our community because we do have a lot of potholes and I know that all the cities are experiencing a lot of potholes too. So we're, we don't have the corner on the market. Um, they're also looking at different financing methods to do maybe more than we typically do two street projects a year. Uh, we're looking at uh, trying to add uh, dollars to fund a third project, and that will be all brought forward for discussion City Council when we start talking about the capital improvement plan. At that time, um, Mr. Love and Ms. Paulson can talk to you about some of their ideas for financing those improvements. So that'll be coming up in June. Okay, thank you. Public Works Director Love, did you want to comment on that as well? Because we certainly are hearing what people have to say about potholes. Now, uh, Mayor and Council, uh, yes, yeah, so just so the, the residents know that we actually do take in all this input. We do track it in a program. Um, our street superintendent does go out. The, the one thing to remember is in the springtime, we're, we're kind of triaging the worst of the worst roads, hitting those really big ones, but we will be coming back to fill in the other ones as well. And as you mentioned, we have an item on consent to do what we call uh, spot paving, uh, which is, is essentially more than a pothole patch. It's stretching a longer stretch of, a, of overall large patch over a really bad area that target the really worst areas. So we're, we have that on consent, and, and then we'll be excited to bring forward our CIP plan to you. Okay, thank you very much. Council Member Smith. Thank you, Mayor. I was just wondering, maybe Mr. Love, if you could talk a little bit about what are reasonable expectations for a pothole patch? <laughs> Mayor and Council, that's a that's a that's a good question. I, uh, a lot of it uh, depends on when are we putting it in, and and what are the weather conditions. So in the early spring, um, we're doing a lot of just throwing the mix in, getting something in, just to hold it to kind of prevent damage and 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 help with safety. Um, then then we do come back with what would be more of a permanent type pothole uh, patch if there's such a thing where we're actually using a roller and we're compressing it in there. Um, the, the, you know, there's a lot of factors that can affect how long it's going to be and then even into the next year with plowing in the winter, uh, that all has a lot of effect as well. What I hear you saying is that it's not uncommon for the pothole crews to come out two and three times, yep. depending on where we are in this window of time. Mayor and Council, it, it's very possible because uh, these, these, we have two crews 
that uh, respond to pothole patching. Um, those two crews also respond to things like uh, flood work, uh, storm sewer repairs, uh, they, they're doing the sweeping of the roads. Uh, so th there are also times where if we have to pull a crew off and then come back at a later time because there's an emergency that we gotta respond to as well. Uh, so yes, there, there'll be multiple times and generally we're coming through the very first time just to really hit the really, really big ones and then we'll be coming back at least a second time and depending on the road conditions, there might be a couple of stretches where we're coming back a couple of times during the summer and those are the stretches that we're trying to target with some of these spot paving, the ones that we have to maintain constantly throughout the summer. Okay, thank you. It's amazing how much time we spend on potholes, but they are important to the quality of life here in our city. And I, I certainly want to assure people that our staff is really looking into this. We spend a lot of time talking with staff about potholes and what do we do about our roads. So, okay, moving on, uh, we have a promotion ceremony tonight, which is always a very fun thing to do. Uh, Chief Nadeau, I'm gonna turn this over to you. It's not very often I get to raise this up. <laughs> <laughs> Mayor and members of the council, when I was hired in July of 2017, one of the responsibilities I was given by our city manager and our HR director was to look at the long-term leadership of the police department and pay attention to succession planning. And as the new public safety director, I've done just that. Over the course of the last um, year and a half, uh, we've worked on building leadership at every level of the public safety departments working together with both police and fire staff. I can say that we've made significant gains not only in building up the leadership of police and fire, but cross-pollinating in public safety as well. One of the things that I realized when I became the public safety director was that in the police department we had senior command staff that were all uh, nearing that age of retirement and that we really needed to look at how we were going to be su sustaining that momentum and building that leadership into the future. I also saw that at the time that I arrived that we had eight sergeants uh, that were over our patrol division, which is our biggest uh, division, but they were only uh, overseen by one commander. So we made the decision at that time that we would reduce the number of sergeants to six sergeants and promote two sergeants to lieutenant, giving a better span of control and making sure that our patrol staff had the tools and resources that they needed to be successful. The uh, effect uh, budget-wise for the city council is, is relatively cost neutral because a sergeant with overtime makes about the same as a lieutenant, which is a salaried position. So these two gentlemen uh, who were both tenured uh, sergeants prior to promotion uh, have made the choice to uh, go back to working uh, nights uh, after uh, obviously having young families and are uh, completely committed to this. So tonight, we'll be recognizing our two new patrol lieutenants who went through a thorough, if not exhausting, testing process with interview boards, written assessments, leadership assessments, in-box exercises, and uh, this included members from our public, uh, as well as our uh, police advisory committee. I can tell you that both of our new lieutenants are big picture thinking leaders who are committed to excellence and service for our citizens. They're also servant leaders who lead by example and we'll focus on developing our patrol staff to work collaboratively to solve the complex issues that police and communities face today. So today, we will call them up individually. Uh, they will then uh, be asked to repeat their oath of office. After the oath of office, like when we bring a new officer in, they'll be asked if they have anyone that they would like to pin their new badge on. Uh, after they do the badge pinning, They'll be asked if they would like to address the council and uh, offer a few words to the council on what they hope to do in uh, leadership positions now that they're lieutenants. So we will start tonight with Lieutenant Brian Beardman. Come up. Brian's son Jordan was the one that led us tonight in the Pledge of Allegiance and did a fantastic job. Brian was born and raised in Fargo, North Dakota. As a youth, he enjoyed sports and spending time outdoors with family and friends. After high school, he attended the University of Minnesota at Moorhead, where he received a bachelor's degree in criminal justice. Brian began his career with the Maplewood Police Department on June 3, 2002, where he would work the night shift for the, nights, for the next 16 years. 
While working on patrol, Brian served as the field training officer for eight years. In 2004, Brian became a firearms and use of force instructor. He then began to coordinate that same program in 2013. In 2005, Brian became a member of the Ramsey County SWAT team on which he served for 10 years. In 2007, Brian became a canine handler. He and his canine partner, Rebel, worked side by side for the next nine years. Canine Rebel specialized in patrol operations, narcotics detection, and was a valuable asset during canine demos and community events. This canine team received three meritorious service awards from the Maplewood Police Department and 10 citations and awards from the United States Canine Association. In 2013, Brian was promoted to the rank of sergeant after serving as acting sergeant for two years. During this time, he was the canine unit supervisor, street crimes unit supervisor, and training unit use of force supervisor. Brian received the FBI Trilogy Award in Leadership in 2018, as well as the training unit receiving a, a unit citation for outstanding training in use of force and officer safety. Brian credits this award to the professionalism of the training staff and the hard work and dedication of the department's officers. Brian attributes his accomplishments over the past 17 years to the supervisors who have mentored and pushed him, as well as the officers and community who have supported him. Brian has told me that he enjoys working in Maplewood as it's a diverse and supportive community where police and community work together to tackle the challenges of 21st century policing. Most importantly, he recognizes the sacrifice, support, and understanding he has received from his wife, Shannon, and his two boys, Connor and Jordan, as well as his daughter, Kaylee. Brian, is there someone that you would like to come up and pin on your new lieutenant's badge? Oh, I'm sorry, we gotta do the oath of the office first. Oh, All right, yep. <laughs> I missed this up the last time too, didn't I? Yeah. All right. I, Brian Gerdman, do solemnly swear. I, Brian Gerdman, do solemnly swear. That I will support. That I will support. The Constitution of the United States. The Constitution of the United States. And of the state of Minnesota. And of the state of Minnesota. And will faithfully discharge. And will faithfully discharge. The duties of lieutenant. The duties of lieutenant. In the city of Maplewood. In the city of Maplewood. In the county of Ramsey. County of Ramsey. And the state of Minnesota. And the state of Minnesota. To the best of my judgment and ability. To the best of my judgment and ability. So help me God. So help me God. <laughs> All right, and now is an opportunity for Brian to be able to address the council and say a few words. Sure. Madam Mayor and Council, thank you. These promotions will no doubt mark a significant change in our department. To give you a little insight into what cops typically think of change, I can tell you that they completely welcome it. That is as long as absolutely nothing is altered, nothing is different. <laughs> I love the quote by Sidney Harris. He said, the dilemma is that we hate change and love it at the same time. What we really want is for things to remain the same, but still get better. Organizations and people that don't embrace change are bound to lose, are bound to lose ground and stagnate. Our mission as a department has not changed, but the way in which we accomplish our mission has. To accomplish our mission, our department has embraced a more community-oriented, problem-solving, data-driven policing strategy. This is a far more focused and effective way to accomplish our mission. To the officers of this department, know that you are the backbone of the agency and its mission. I commit myself to making sure you are properly trained, supported, supervised, and healthy both physically and mentally. Your thoughts, opinions, and ideas on how we accomplish our mission does matter, as you are the closest to the work than anyone else in the department. I know this job can be hard, I know it can be stressful, and I understand all the risks, but know that you are the leaders and the true leaders of the agency. To the supervisors, I commit myself to empowering you to focus on the mission and the needs of those whom you are responsible. I will do my best to grow and promote you as leaders. I expect you to recognize good work and for you to do all that you can 
uh, to help those you supervise succeed within our mission. Mayor Council, change is coming. It's inevitable and we can't stop it. And we have important challenges that are before us. I'm impressed by the city, by its community, and I'm proud of the police department and especially the officers that bravely serve it every day. I'm honored to be sworn in tonight as the new, as the new role of police lieutenant and I look forward to serving the city of Maplewood. Thank you. That was uh, impressive. Uh, <laughs> this time I'd like to call up uh, Lieutenant uh, Dan Buzak. Dan was born and raised in Echo, Minnesota, which is in southwestern Minnesota. Growing up, he enjoyed hunting and spending time outdoors and playing sports. He graduated from the University of St. Thomas with a bachelor's degree in criminal justice in 1998. Dan began his career with the Maplewood Police Department on August 9, 1999. Dan was a hardworking officer during his eight years on patrol, and he says this is where he learned how to work with the community. In 2001, Dan became a firearms use of force instructor, and in 2007, he began to coordinate the program. He still enjoys working with Maplewood's officers to sharpen their skills. In 2002, Dan became one of the department's field training officers, knowing it was important to pass along the skills and knowledge they would need to be successful. Later in 2007, he was promoted to the rank of sergeant, a position he has held for the last 12 years. Lieutenant Buzak took on the role of field training coordinator in 2018 when the department was looking to update its philosophy and methodology to reflect the ever-changing workforce. He is also active on the department's first strategic planning committee and along with Lieutenant Beardman, facilitated the police department's 2019 strategic planning process. Dan is excited about being a lieutenant because he believes that the Maplewood Police Department is on the right path and he wants to be a part of ensuring that the direction of the department continues on a path towards effective leadership and community outreach. While this career can be often stressful and demanding, Lieutenant Buzak attributes much of his success in his career to having a strong support system, which includes his wife, Anne Marie, and his daughters, Ella and Olivia. <coughs> If you could come up, we can read the oath. I'll get the order right this time. <laughs> I, Dan Buzak, do solemnly swear. I, Dan Buzak, do solemnly swear. That I will support. That I will support. The Constitution of the United States. The Constitution of the United States. And of the, um, of the state of Minnesota. And of the state of Minnesota. And will faithfully discharge. And will faithfully discharge. The duties of lieutenant. The duties of lieutenant. In the city of Maplewood. In the city of Maplewood. In the county of Ramsey. In the county of Ramsey. In the state of Minnesota. In the state of Minnesota. To the best of my judgment and ability. To the best of my judgment and ability. So help me God. So help me God. Dan, is there somebody that you would like to come up and pin on your new lieutenant's badge? Yes. I'd like uh, Lieutenant Buzak to offer a few words to the council. I don't know if I can follow that up. <laughs> <laughs> Madam Mayor and Council, I am thankful for and feel privileged to have the opportunity to be a lieutenant for the Maplewood Police Department. I have very much enjoyed the almost 20 years I have been here and look forward to this new chapter in my career. Along the way, I have had the opportunity to work with and learn from great people on all levels within the police department and throughout this city. While this has been a very good police department to work for, I believe that we are currently on a trajectory for greater things, and this is what I am most excited about in this new role. I am looking forward to continuing to make this a greater city for all of our residents through collaboration with stakeholders, problem solving, and increased community outreach which are all staples of our department's strategic plan. Equally important, I look forward to working to make this a police department our current officers continue to be proud of, enjoy working for, are supported by, 
in one in which they are empowered to use their unique talents and skills. With the help of all of the talented members of the Maplewood Police Department, I believe we can make this a destination for new hires in these times where hiring has become more difficult. I am hopeful that this new position will give me a stronger voice to ensure that we continue on a path toward greater things well into the future. You know you're old and you've been here a long time when you remember when these people started. <laughs> Chief Nadeau, you are on for our next agenda item. Proclamation recognizing National Police Week. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, this uh, week uh, is National Police Week. And it was actually uh, since 1962 when President, at the time, John Kennedy, uh, designated May 15th to be uh, remembered as the day uh, to remember both uh, officers who had died the line of duty, as well as a day to honor uh, officers that were currently in service to our communities. Uh, there is a proclamation uh, that has been prepared for uh, our city, which recognizes both of these facts, as well as remembering Sergeant Joseph Bergeron, who was uh, unfortunately shot and killed in the line of duty uh, in 2010. Uh, would you like me to read the proclamation, Mayor? You know, Council Member Juniman has uh, asked to please read the proclamation. <laughs> Every once in a while I can outclass somebody, but not very often. Recognizing National Police Week 2019. Whereas there are approximately 900,000 law enforcement officers serving in communities across the United States, including the 52 dedicated sworn officers of the Maplewood Police Department. Whereas since the first recorded death in 1791, more than 21,000 law enforcement officers in the United States have made the ultimate sacrifice and been killed in the line of duty, including Sergeant Joseph Bergeron of the Maplewood Police Department. Whereas Sergeant Bergeron and all officers killed in the line of duty have their names engraved on the wall of the National Law Enforcement Officers Memorial in Washington, D.C. Whereas in 1962, President John F. Kennedy signed a proclamation designating May 15th as National Peace Officers Memorial Day and the week in which the state falls as Police Week. Whereas Police Week 2019 in the United States of America began yesterday, Sunday, May 12th, and will end on Saturday, May 18th, 2019. Whereas the service and sacrifice of all officers killed in the line of duty will be honored during Minnesota Law Enforcement Memorial Association's annual candlelight vigil at 7 p.m. May 15th, 2019 on the grounds of the Minnesota State Capitol in St. Paul. Whereas Ramsey County suburban law enforcement officers killed in the line of duty will be honored during the suburban Ramsey County Law Enforcement Memorial Ceremony at 11 a.m. Thursday, May 16th, 2019, at Abiding Savior Lutheran Church in Moundsview, Minnesota. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the Maplewood City Council formally designates May 12 to May 18, 2019, Police Week in the city of Maplewood as a time to honor the service and sacrifice of law enforcement officers killed in the line of duty while protecting our communities and safeguarding our democracy, adopted this 13th day of May 
excuse me, 2019. Do I have a motion to approve? I hereby move the proclamation recognizing Pol National Police Week 2019. Second. Moved by Juniman, seconded by Neblet. Proclamation to uh, uh, recognizing National Police Week for 2019. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Motion passes. Thank you, Mayor. We move on to the consent agenda. We have a reappointment here. Oh, I'm sorry. Resolution for commission reappointments. Uh, city Manager Coleman, do you want to take that? Yes, thank you, Mayor Abrams, members of the City Council. Uh, Kimmy Porter's term on the Park and Recreation Commission expired on April 30th of this year. She is uh, seeking reappointment, and she's filled out the assessment to evaluate her time on the commission and to provide input to the council. Um, what we're asking, her term uh, will be uh, extended to, there's a resolution here for your approval. It appoints her to the Park and Recreation Commission term to expire on April 30th, 2022. And I don't think she's here. Is Kimmy here? I don't, I don't see, see her. her. So with that, Mayor, we just need a resolution or a motion to approve the resolution for the commission reappointment. Is there a motion? Move. Moved, moved by Neblet, seconded by Smith, a motion to approve the attached resolution for commission reappointment for Kimmy Porter. Uh, any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Motion passes. <clears throat> now we move on to the consent agenda. <laughs> any highlights, any discussion of the consent agenda? If not, do I have a motion? So moved. Second. Moved by Knudsen, seconded by Juniman. Consent agenda items one through nine. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Consent agenda passes. Now we move on to the public hearing portion of our meeting, and we have two separate public hearings having to do with two different city projects. The first one is the Mayland Crestview Forest Area Pavement Rehabilitation. Um, city Clerk Sint, is there anyone signed up for the public hearing? I'm going to open it up. I'm going to open up the public. Oh, excuse me. <laughs> A little off my game there. Can we revert, Mr. Beatty? Can we go back to the staff report? I'm sorry. Mayor, Council, uh, good evening again. Uh, tonight with me is uh, John Giroux. She's our assistant city engineer and lead project engineer for the project. We do have a staff presentation uh, to give you. I would also like to say that uh, we have uh, Tyler Strong. He's one of our staff engineers. So after the council has uh, finished with this item, he'll be available out in the lobby if residents have additional questions or anything. Um, with that, I'll, I'll turn it over to John. Thank you, Steve. If I could get the presentation up. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mayor Council. Uh, tonight we're here to talk about the Mayland Crestview Forest Area Pavement Rehabilitation City Project 18-27. Uh, tonight we'll hold the assessment hearing, uh, consider adopting the assessment role, as well as consider awarding a construction contract. So the streets included with this improvement are shown on the right-hand side of the screen. They're generally bounded by McKnight Road on the west, London Lane on the north, uh, Century Avenue on the east, and Hillwood Drive on the south. So this project was established as part of the city's uh, approved 2019 to 2023 capital improvement plan, and it does represent one of the key components in meeting uh, the goals of the city's uh, strategic plan. So looking at the project timeline, the feasibility study for this project was ordered back in August of last year. Uh, we brought that feasibility report to council of, in February of this year, at which time it was approved. We held a public hearing in March of this year um, and we opened bids just a couple weeks back on May 3rd. Looking at what a special assessment is, um, special assessments are one of the funding sources the city utilizes to finance public improvement projects. So properties within the project area that directly abut the improvements are asked to pay an assessment for the direct benefit to their property. And each year the city council sets the maximum rates uh, for the various types of improvement projects. 
And then during the project development phase, uh, the city hires an independent appraisal firm to determine what that actual benefit is received by the properties in the area. And then per Minnesota state statute, the city cannot assess for more than the uh, direct benefit to the properties. So prior to tonight's meeting, the residents in the project area were mailed an official notice of their assessment, and that assessment notice included uh, the amount of their assessment, what options were available for paying that assessment, uh, what options are available for deferring the assessment, as well as the residents' right to object to their assessment. And staff did host a neighborhood meeting last week on May 6th, um, just to directly cover those assessments and work out any issues residents might have with those, and I believe approximately 15 to 20 residents attended that meeting. There are a number of options for paying assessments. Uh, residents can make a full or partial payment to the city through mid-November of the year, with the remaining amount of their assessments being certified uh, to Ramsey County after that time, or the full amount of the assessments can be certified uh, to be paid with their taxes um, through Ramsey County. Now it's worth noting that there is a 30-day interest-free period um, starting after the assessment hearing in which residents can pay any portion of their assessment amount interest-free and that at the end of that 30-day period, interest does begin accruing dating back to the assessment hearing tonight. Um, all certified amounts would be paid over a 15-year period with their Ramsey County property taxes at a 5% interest rate. There are also a number of options for deferring your assessment. Um, if you're 65 years of age or older, if you're retired uh, due to a disability, if you're a member of the armed forces called into active duty, uh, if you've, or if you have a proven financial hardship, um, you can request a deferral, which would basically delay when that assessment needs to be paid for a 15-year period, but it does accumulate interest during that time frame and does come due with interest at the end of that period. Um, for vacant uh, parcels, there is also the option for the undeveloped property deferral, which is also for a 15-year period with 5% interest. Uh, however, if no improvements are made to that property within that 15-year period, that assessment would be terminated. In total, there are 232 accessible parcels in the project area uh, with a single family pavement rehab rate of $3,450. The uh, townhome and multifamily properties within the project area are being assessed at a $69 per accessible foot rate. We also have um, a half unit assessment rate, which we'll talk about a little more on the next slide, um, and that applies to the McKnight townhomes in the area at uh, $348.31. The proposed total assessment amount is $626,256.69, and that represents approximately 42% of the total project cost. So a little bit of a unique situation in this project is the McKnight townhomes. So if you refer to that map on the right-hand side of your screen, um, in the lower right-hand corner, those properties highlighted in blue um, have, both, have private driveway accesses onto both Dorland Road as well as on Mayland Road. Um, and all the blue highlighted properties on that map were assessed for one half of an assessment unit as part of the Pond Dorland project a couple years back. The properties on the map that are highlighted in red, they have access only onto Dorland Road and they were assessed for one full unit as part of that project. Now looking at our project from last year, those properties on the top of your screen um, that are highlighted in blue, they were assessed for an additional half unit for the improvements to London Lane. So in total, those properties paid one full assessment unit. Now as part of this project, the properties highlighted in blue at the bottom who have access onto both Mayland and Dorland Road are proposed to be assessed for an additional half unit as part of this project. So in total, they will also have paid one full assessment unit. And staff does feel that this is a, you know, a, a consistent and equitable treatment of all properties in the area uh, per the assessment policy. So property owners um, may submit written objection or deferral requests to the city. And those uh, objection or deferral requests must be received before the conclusion of the assessment hearing tonight. Uh, no, no objections would be accepted after we're done with that hearing. Uh, to date, we have received five objection or deferral requests. Uh, we have three objections to those half assessments that I talked about on that last slide. Uh, 2363 Dorland Court, 469 Mayland Court, four, six, and 469 Dorland Court. And then we have an objection uh, to the assessment as well as a deferral request from 563 Deer Ridge Lane, 
as well as one deferral request from 515 Crestview Forest Drive. And staff is recommending uh, the adoption of the assessment role except those with objections of which a recommendation would be made at the May 28th council meeting. So like I said before, we held a bid opening on May 3rd. We received four valid bids on this project. Uh, T.A. Shifsky & Sons was the lowest bidder on this project with a bid of $1,333,021.13 uh, for reference. The engineer's estimate on this project was $1,430,000. Um, so we got really good bid prices on, on this project here. Uh, the approved project budget is $1,604,400. Uh, the total estimated project cost, including indirect costs and 10% contingencies, is $1,512,000, which falls uh, within that approved project budget. So the next steps is the City Council should hold the assessment hearing tonight and receive public input on the proposed assessments. And after that, close that assessment hearing. And then the City Council should consider uh, adopting that resolution, um, adopting the assessment rule. And staff is recommending adopting the assessment role except those with objections of which a recommendation would be made at the May 28th, 2019 City Council meeting. Um, and just one final reminder that the assessment hearing is the last opportunity for residents to object to their assessment. Thank you. Council members, do you have any questions? I have one more slide. Oh. <laughs> uh, after that, uh, the council... <laughs> The you know, city sometimes there are just those nights. That's yeah. just the way it's it is. It's a little warm in here. Yeah, uh, it's very warm in yeah. here. <laughs> the city council will then consider awarding a construct construction contract, yes. and this is a separate action that will be considered if the city council approves the resolution accepting the assessment rule. And staff is recommending approval of the resolution, receiving bids and awarding a construction contract for the Mayland Crestview Forest Area Pavement Rehabilitation Project, City Project 18-27, to T.A. Shifsky & Sons. Yeah. Uh, if the project is approved tonight, construction will begin in early July of 2019 and be wrapped up by mid-September. And our staff is available for questions. Okay. Does anyone have any questions? All right. Then seeing no questions, now we're going to move to the public hearing of the assessment, be an assessment hearing. And we have two representatives, two individuals who want to speak. I'll open up the public hearing at 8.04 on the Mayland Crestview Forest Area Pavement Rehabilitation City Project 18-27. The first individual on the list is Philip Krinke from 504 McKnight Road South. Good evening. Good evening, uh, Mayor and uh, Council Members. Uh, thank you for the opportunity. I just wanted to uh, express my opposition to the uh, uh, proposed assessment at 504 South McKnight Road. Uh, an assessment or proposed assessment of $10,350 uh, for a uh, single uh, residence. Uh, again, uh, I think it's about 150 uh, front feet on uh, on Mayland Avenue. So. Uh, I don't believe that uh, this proposed assessment uh, would be a direct benefit to the property of uh, over $10,000. Uh, so uh, with that, uh, I appreciate the opportunity to appear and uh, would say uh, it's probably been about 45 years before I've, uh, since I've been before the Maplewood City Council. So I appreciate uh, <laughs> coming back and uh, I do all uh, certainly thank you for your public service. Thank you. The next individual on our list is Paul Beaumont, 1216 Ferndale Street North. Good evening. Hi, good evening. Besides being on a fixed income, both of us are retired. My wife's a full-time student. We don't have the money for the assessment, but I would like to address the city attorney and propose that he somehow contact the uh, Metropolitan Council. Since we moved in in 1998, that street has been a bus route. Uh, we're talking about Ferndale Street North and Ivy Project. It's been a bus route. 
and I was informed by the city engineers that they didn't even know that it was a bus route. The pavement is not suited for running buses on. So since 1998, they've been patching it, patching it, patching it, patching it. The houses there were built on a swamp the year after the state of Minnesota put a moratorium on building on swamp material. It was built in 1981 and the state put a moratorium on it in 1980. And the properties are sinking, all except our driveway apron, which is flooded every time it rains. I busted through the ice this winter one time and just about didn't get out of it with a four-wheel drive because there's a hump between us and the drain. Uh, we get charged for every ounce of rain that comes down the hill and comes through our property and goes into the storm drain. And on top of that, my neighbor, who's kitty corner across our driveway, now we're in quad homes, he is being charged taxes and, and uh, assessment for that drainage water for over an acre of land. And he doesn't even have a quarter of an acre. So if you guys could look into something like that, my time is about out. Mr. Bowman, Beaumont, is that? Yes, Beaumont. Did they, I say that correctly? Um, you're actually here for the wrong public hearing. The Ferndale project is going to be next. This one that we're Well, we got a letter in the mail saying it was tonight. Oh, it is tonight. But we have two public hearings. The first one has to do with I'm Mayland sorry. Crestview Forest <laughs> Area Pavement. You can come back in just a few minutes, OK? Is there anyone else? that would like to speak at the public hearing? Is there anyone else that would like to speak at the public hearing? I have to say it three times. Is there anyone else that would like to speak at the public hearing? Then with that, I will close the public hearing. Mr. Love, do you have any other comments that you'd like to make? Um, Mayor and Council, I, I know that uh, the property of 504, uh, one of the things that our policy does is if you have a larger piece of property that could be subdivided, you look at that and you assess it for the potential um, subdivision. In this case, it's, it's right now one piece of property. There uh, is, is room to do two additional uh, parcels on there if it was ever to be subdivided. And this is where we, uh, and I know that uh, there was a objection form filled out and I believe was the undeveloped deferral this is where we would recommend um, working with the property owner to file a unde undeveloped deferral uh, where again that's where if for 15 years if that property is not subdivided then those two assessments would go away okay and is that something that you will speak with uh, mr. Krinky about after the meeting tonight we certainly can okay thank you Council members, do you have anything else that you would like to add? Okay, then Council Member Juniman. Uh, one last time, we probably need to remind them that they need to file an objection before you lay down the gavel the last time. So Pardon me? If there's anyone else in the room that wants to file an objection for this project, they have to do it before you wrap the gavel. Oh, did she? I didn't, I didn't yes, hear it. Yes, I already closed it. Uh oh. <laughs> Is there anything else that anyone else would like to add? Nope. Then do I have a motion to approve the resolution adopting the assessment role for the Mayland Crestview Forest Area Pavement Rehabilitation City Project? So move. Second. Moved by Juniman, seconded by Smith. Motion to approve the resolution adopting assessment role for the Mayland Crestview <laughs> Forest Area Pavement Rehabilitation. Any further discussion? Mm -hmm. Then all those in favor? Aye. 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 Motion passes. We have another motion that we are uh, need to take tonight. Do I have a motion to approve the resolution receiving bids and awarding the construction contract for the Mayland Crestview Forest Area Rehabilitation Project? I move that. Uh, um, I move that <laughs> resolution and award that awarding that contract to T. A. Shifsky and Sons. Second. 
Moved by Juniman, seconded by Neblet to approve the resolution receiving bids and awarding construction contract for the Mayland Crestview Forest Area Pavement Rehabilitation. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 The motion passes. Thank you very much. Mr. Krinky, we have one more public hearing. So if you want to wait and maybe you can talk with Mr. Love and Mr. Jerish after we're done with everything, that would be good. Okay, we're moving on now to the Ferndale project. Ferndale Ivy Area Improvement City Project 1801. Um, Mr. Love, are you taking this or is Mr. Jerish? Uh, Mayor and Council, uh, so uh, this is very similar to what we just did. So John is here again to provide a presentation. It's going to be some of uh, the same information uh, that the last one had. Okay. Uh, and then uh, Tyler Strong will be available out outside in the lobby area as well. And then John will be able to join him after this item is closed. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you, Steve. Thank you, Mayor Council. So this is the Ferndale Ivy Area Street Improvement Project, City Project 18-01. Uh, tonight, again, we'll hold an assessment hearing, consider adoption of an assessment role, as well as awarding a construction contract. Uh, the project streets included with this project are uh, shown on the right-hand side of the screen and are generally bounded by Maryland Avenue to the south, uh, as well as Century Avenue to the east. Again, this uh, project was established as part of the city's 2019 to 2023 capital improvement plan, and it does represent uh, the key, one of the key components in meeting the city's uh, goals and its strategic plan. So the feasibility study for this project was also ordered back on August 27th of last year. That feasibility study was uh, brought to council and approved on February 11th of this year, with a public hearing uh, being held on February 25th. And again, bids were opened a couple weeks back on May 3rd. Uh, so the special assessments, uh, like we talked about before, they're one of the funding sources that the city utilizes to finance public improvement projects. Um, the properties in the project area that are directly abutting the improvements uh, pay an assessment uh, for the direct benefit to their properties, uh, with the maximum rate being set by the city council on a yearly basis. And then again, we have hired an independent appraisal firm uh, to determine what that direct benefit to the properties in the area were. Uh, and then per Minnesota state statute, um, that assessment amount could not be more than the direct benefit to the properties. So prior to tonight's assessment hearing, the residents were mailed out that same uh, official assessment notice, uh, including that information shown on the screen. Um, and we held a neighborhood meeting to cover those assessments uh, back last week on May 7th. And again, at that meeting, we had about 15 to 20 residents show up. Uh, same options that we talked about uh, with the last public hearing. Um, residents in the area can make full or partial payments to the city through November of the year, mid-November of the year, with that remaining amount being certified to be uh, paid with the taxes with Ramsey County. Um, the full or the full assessment amount could be certified to be paid with the taxes over a 15 year period. There's also that 30 day interest free period uh, directly after tonight's assessment hearing in which residents can make payments to the city interest free, but interest does begin accruing after that uh, time frame uh, dating back to the assessment hearing tonight. And then all certified amounts would be paid over a 15 year period with the Ramsey County property taxes at a 5% interest rate. Uh, we also have those same deferral options we talked about at the last uh, public hearing. Um, all those deferral options listed on the screen are for a 15-year period uh, with a 5% interest rate, and they all come due at the end of that 15-year period uh, with accumulated interest. And we also have the undeveloped property deferral for uh, vacant properties. In total, there are 172 accessible parcels in the project area. The single family full reconstruction rate with this project is $6,600. Uh, the townhome and multifamily properties in the area were assessed at a rate of $120 uh, per accessible front foot. Uh, the proposed assessment total is $849,284.52, and that's roughly 27% of the total project cost. So property owners in the area um, can submit a written objection or deferral request to the city, and those objection or deferral requests must be received before the conclusion of the assessment hearing tonight. 
Uh, to date, um, prior to the, uh, the uh, put together this uh, presentation, we had three deferral requests, one from 1235 Ferndale Street, one from 1274 Dennis Street, and one from 1225 Farrell Street. And then right before the meeting here, we did um, receive two more, one from 1225 Ferndale Street, uh, unit number three. That was an objection to their assessment. And we also received an objection and deferral request from 1276 Ferndale Street. And it looks like we have one more from 1216 Ferndale Street uh, requesting a deferral. And one more from 1224 Farrell Street, uh, also requesting a deferral. So city staff is recommending adopting the assessment role, except those that have objected, of which a recommendation will be made at the May 28th, 2019 city council meeting. The bidding open, bid opening for this project was also held on May 3rd. Uh, we had two bidders on this project, of which T.A. Shifsky and Sons was the low bidder. Uh, their bid of $3,586,720 um, was the lowest bid, but it was above the engineer's estimate of $3,225,225. In talking to neighboring cities and other industry professionals, it's uh, reflective of the uh, increased construction costs that are being seen throughout the industry. Uh, so due to those increased construction costs, uh, staff is not recommending awarding bid alternate number one at this time. Bid alternate number one represented the Maryland Avenue sidewalk extension. The approved project budget is $3,806,000. The estimated total project cost, including indirect costs and 10% contingencies, is $4,089,000. Uh, that en estimated increase um, is to be uh, projected to be funded by the Street Revitalization Fund, as well as uh, potential project savings seen on our other two projects that uh, came in under the estimates. So staff is recommending that the council hold that public hearing tonight and receive public <coughs> input on the proposed assessments and then close the assessment hearing. And then council should also consider the resolution for adopting the assessment role, of which staff is recommending adopting the assessment role, except those with objections, of which a recommendation will be made at the following council meeting on May 28th. And just one last reminder, the assessment hearing is your last opportunity to object to your assessment. Mm -hmm. The council should also consider awarding a construction contract tonight. This is a separate action uh, that's considered after the council approves the uh, uh, accepting the assessment role and staff is recommending approval of the resolution, receiving bids and awarding a construction contract for the Ferndale Ivy Area Street Improvement Project, City Project 1801, 2TA Shifsky and Sons. Uh, if this project is approved tonight, construction will begin in early June and be completed in mid-October of the year. And with that, staff is available for questions. Anyone have any questions or comments for Mr. Jarish? City Ferguson, do we have, I'm going to open up the, the public hearing. I'll open up the public hearing. Do we have anyone who would like to speak? We don't have anybody signed up. Okay. Mr. Beaumont, I'd like to. Yeah. Mr. Beaumont, would you like to now come up and make your presentation? No. I pretty much said it all. I don't understand all this. Mm -hmm. I see that if you're over 65, there's some kind of a deferral of both my wife and I, are, I'm, I'm pushing 79 this year mm -hmm. and still breathing. Mm -hmm. But it really fries me that the uh, Metro Transit can get away with running a bus on our street that only has three inches of asphalt on mm -hmm. it. It's not made for running buses on it. Mm -hmm. And the way I understand it, the new paving is not going to be made for running buses on it either. Is that correct, Mr. Love? You know, what we'll do is we'll give staff an opportunity and council an opportunity okay. to talk after anyway, the public hearing. Anyway, uh, that's, you know, we can't afford it. Uh, we're both retired on Social Security, and it's just tough to, to make it. And uh, like I say, I, if it's going to be chewed up by the buses continually, then the buses ought to be paying for it. 
all I got to say. Okay. Thank you for your time. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Is there anyone else who would like to speak? Do you want to go and sign in with uh, City Clerk Sint, please? Would you like to come up and speak at the, uh, the uh, at the microphone, please? Thank you for hearing my husband out. My name is Karen Beaumont. I live at 1216 Ferndale. I appreciate your time this evening. I am curious uh, about the financial portion of this assessment. As I looked at the other. Um, thing that you're going to be doing in the other part of Maplewood. I see that you are charging the townhomes $120 per lineal, linear foot, is that correct? But in the, other, in the other project that you're doing, it's only $69. And I, I'm wondering what the difference is, and I don't understand why what you're doing that is much more expensive for our neighborhood than it is for the other neighborhood. And I also wonder, um, what else was I wondering? <laughs> um, forgive me, I can't remember what it was. But I, I'm just curious about this. And, and, oh, I know what it was. I understand that you won't be putting in pipes, which is what I was, we were told we, was going to happen when we first heard about this project, there, there won't be any pipes put into the street for water reduction, which in our neighborhood, it's a tremendous problem. We have lakes all over the back ends of our townhomes because, um, because of the water table in that area. And so if they're not putting in pipes, then what is it that's costing as much as it is? That's, that's all I wondered. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else who would like to speak? Is there anyone else who would like to speak? This is your last chance, second to the last chance. Mm -hmm. Is there anyone else who would like to speak at the public hearing? Okay, with that, I'll close the public hearing. Uh, Mr. Love, we have a few questions. If you could respond <coughs> to those, that would be very helpful. Sure, Mayor and Council. So um, all our roads are designed for a nine-ton road. This this is a design that would accommodate uh, buses as well as um, garbage trucks and, and and the additional traffic on there. So there, we have a number of roads that are city roads that have um, bus routes on them. Um, so we do design for, design for that in our plans. The difference between this project and last project is this is a full street reconstruction project where the last project was a pavement reclamation project. So essentially that project, the first project that we talked about today was um, we're going to reclaim the road. So we're going to grind up the asphalt into the aggregate base, recompact it, and put a new, ag uh, new pavement section on top. This is much more intensive. Uh, there's a lot of utility improvements. There's stormwater improvements. There's water main replacement, sanitary sewer fixes. Uh, there's a large amount of curb being replaced. Um, so it's a much more intensive um, uh, project. And that's why when we hire an independent appraiser, one of the things they take a look at is what is this project going to do and when they're determining that assessment benefit amount. Will the uh, work that you are currently planning on doing, will that address the water problems that the Beaumonts have raised? Uh, Mayor and Council, so it will address some of the problems. So one of the things we know that it, there's a high groundwater table, so we're putting in a two-foot sand subcut, and we're also putting drain tile in underneath the road to help preserve the life of the road. <coughs> we also are uh, planning some extensive storm sewer improvements uh, in, in the network there as well. Uh, that doesn't mean that we're gonna have uh, the ability to pick up drainage behind every person's uh, individual property. Okay. 
Um, Council Member Juniman. Thank you, Mayor. Um, you answered the question I was, because I was, this, that um, our, all, our roads are all built for buses. And um, I think the problem is that that road's been in bad shape for a long time. And because of the water table, it hasn't helped anything. But it, if it can take a loaded garbage truck, it can take a bus. <laughs> garbage trucks are heavy. Um, about the drainage in that area, I know it's, you know, it's, I'm so old, I remember that, like he said, before those houses were there, that was really swampy. And um, so it's like always an issue, but there's that behind the houses to the west. Um, the, there's a um, pond, holding pond, right on Maryland, where some of that water ultimately ends up. And have we not addressed that a couple times in the past? Uh, Mayor and Council, so um, back in 2011, we had uh, some uh, large storm come through and it raised a number of flooding issues. Right. You might recall as part of the start of this project when we were doing the, before we did the feasibility, we hired a consultant to do a overall regional drainage study of this area. So we utilized those results in our feasibility study and the planning for the drainage. So most of this drainage does head from the east to the west and into that drainage basin. Do we still have sediment problems with that drainage basin or not? Uh, Mayor and Council, I'm not aware of a sediment problem in there. Uh, okay. But you know, with, with our proposed improvements, we also normally install like uh, sump catch basins, way to capture sediment before it gets out there. So it, it does provide improvements. Right, so one way or the other, that's what I'm trying to get at is, there's more than one way to look at or go about this, and we're doing the best we can with that low area. And I know that that pond's been an issue over time. Thanks for the answer. Council Member Smith. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Uh, Mr. Love, I don't mean to uh, beat a dead horse here, but uh, when it comes to the drainage, uh, I think uh, the lady's point is fair that we really understand of the, of the sewer, storm sewer in particular, but those sewer improvements what can the residents expect as far as improvement? Like, I know it's not gonna solve 100% of the problems, but can we kind of give them an idea of, of what's a, what we're hoping to solve in this process? Sure, Mayor and Council, I'll, I'll, I'll start, and if I miss something, I'll, I'll have John uh, jump <laughs> in here. So um, one of the big things is how do we protect the life of this investment? So we put in a two-foot sand subcut, and then we put drain tile underneath the road. So that helps keep the water out of the road section, helps us with our freeze-thaw cycle. So that's one of the big things that we're doing. We're also um, extending storm sewer uh, to the east where we have a large amount of runoff that currently runs off the apartments uh, off of um, Century Avenue and, that, and it right now flows down a ditch and, and we've done some preliminary work uh, uh, to, to try to relieve some flooding issues there but we're going to extend storm sewer up there to try to catch that before okay. it flows into the neighborhood. Uh, we also have a, additional storm sewer improvements um, within the road to pick up our uh, inlet capacity uh, so that we're not having as much water um, standing in the road as well. That's good. Is that along Ivy where the ditches are? That is, get my right map in front of me. Mayor Council, um, that is um, east of Hawthorne. So it's the bottom of that loop uh, where if you were to extend Hawthorne mm -hmm. to the east, because at one point it was platted right away there, that's how we have the right away to, to extend the storm sewer. Uh, it's, it's drainage that's coming from Century and the apartments there the that right comes down, down to that corner of that curve and it comes over land and it runs the risk of going into one of the residential properties, but then it also then ends up in our streets and, and so we're gonna pick it up into the storm system before it has a chance to do that. That should really help. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Really help. And then what was the, what was the second storm sewer piece? Uh, we, we've also added additional storm sewer uh, throughout the network uh, just to increase the capacity and get the water off the road. Excellent. And the water off the road also means hopefully water off of property and things like that. Well, Mayor and Council, we're not necessarily directing the runoff that might be um, running in somebody's backyard. Uh, we're certainly, if it, like in the one case, we're trying to intercept it so it doesn't happen. But, um, you know, the, there's a certain amount of runoff that comes off of people's roofs and, and, and on the land itself. So that, that's still going to be there. 
like the issue Mr. Beaumont brought up about his apron. Is that the sort of thing we're hoping to address? Mayor, yes. Mayor and Council, that's kind of what you would expect to see help with um, with the uh, uh, drain tile underneath the road so that your road stays in good shape as well as the amount of water uh, getting into the system versus standing on the road. Thank you. I'm yep. sorry to grill you, but that's oh, really helpful. That's okay. Anything else, council members? Okay, with one question. Okay, Ms. Council Member Knudsen. You can only have one. <laughs> Just in in reviewing these projects, um, I noticed, you know, this one is much more intense. Yet, you know, it uh, asked for assessments covering 27 percent, whereas the other one was 42. Is that the way you mitigate um, some of these more intense projects? That, can't so, be assessed. So, Mayor and Council, we can't assess for more than the benefit. Now, mm -hmm. one of the things is, as you mentioned, this particular project is much more extensive. So, the city and the taxpayers are paying for more of the project. So, you have a much higher cost of a project, $4 million project. You have a certain amount of assessments, and that's what sets that percentage. It's not a goal of ours other than to assess that there has to be at least 20% or more uh, mm -hmm. of the project being paid by assessments to use uh, the geo bonding. Um, but okay. it's really a determination of one project is much more intense mm -hmm. and you're going to have much more contribution from, um, for, from the bonding as well as the sewer or the uh, enterprise funds such as the EUF and the storm sewer fund. And, and St. Paul Regional Water is also a major uh, contributor. So for the replacement of the water main, the St. Paul Regional Water pays for that. So we initially pay for it to the contractor and then we get reimbursed from St. Paul Water. Thank you very much. Okay, with that, I'll entertain a motion to approve the resolution. I move approval of the resolution adopting the assessment roll less objections for the Ferndale Ivy Street Improvement Project, City Projects 18-01. Second. Moved by Juniman, seconded by Knudsen, a motion to approve the resolution adopting assessment roll for the Ferndale Ivy Area Street, minus the objections, City Project 1801. Uh, any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Motion passes. I further move the resolution receiving the bids and awarding the construction contract to T.A. Shifsky and Sons for this same project. Second. Moved by Juniman, seconded by Knudsen, a motion to approve the resolution receiving bids and awarding construction contract for the Ferndale Ivy Area Street improvements. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Motion passes. Beaumont and Mr. Krinky, if you want to meet staff outside um, so that you can finish up. Mayor, I have a Public link. Works Director Love wanted to say something yep, first. Yep, Mayor and Council. So uh, John Jarosh, our project engineer, will mm -hmm. be out there to assist them. Uh, he's also able to assist them with the deferral questions. Okay. If you'd like to go and meet him outside in the, the lobby, that would be great. Council Member Juniman. Thank you. I have a log or logistics question about the preceding project. When I moved the resolution adopting the assessment rule, I did not state less objections. Do we have to go back and redo that? Or is that understood? Madam Mayor and Council, um, I didn't catch that. If that was your intent, then I, I would suggest that you restate the, the motion and have, it, uh, have a second vote. Okay. Okay. We're going back to the preceding project where I voted on the I move the assessments roll, and I'm neglected to say less objections. So we're back now on the mail and crest view. Pardon me? Yeah, right. It's one of those nights, I think. I think the heat's getting to me. And if it's getting to me, you should be dead because I'm, I'm usually cold. Good. No. So I'm. I'm in here. We're back to the mail and crest view. I <laughs> move the resolution adopting the assessment roll minus the objections for City Project 18 27. Second. Moved by Juniman to approve the resolution adopting assessment role minus objections for the Mayland and Crestview Forest Area Pavement Rehabilitation. Seconded by Knudsen. <coughs> Any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay, I feel better now. Okay. Yeah. Council Member Smith, thank you. you something? I, I just really want to thank the Beaumonts and others who've come in tonight. This is really complicated. I've been doing this now for three plus years and I still don't totally get it. Um, so uh, I just really appreciate you guys coming in and engaging on this stuff. And for staff, I really appreciate how hard you guys work at making this accessible to everybody because it's, it's complicated stuff and uh, 
you know, I hope we can find good resolutions for everybody. But um, thanks for coming in, everyone. And might I suggest that we could include in the future motions minus the objections, just so that we remember to get so those in there? If we're feeble-minded, we don't have to do yeah. it. <laughs> Mayor and Council, that's a great idea. We'll, we'll okay. make sure to do that. Very that way good. we can cover. And might for our we also heads. do something about the heat in future meetings? <laughs> yes. <laughs> oh my God! If I'm hot, they should be dead. Because I'm never hot. <laughs> I'm dying. All right. We have no unfinished business. We're moving on to new business. We need a fan in here. Uh, City Manager Coleman, do you want to start with the cable television franchise ordinance? Sure. <laughs> <laughs> Mayor Abrams, members of the City Council, um, the City, as you know, we talked about this at the workshop about the renewal with Comcast for our franchise ordinance with the company for a 10-year period, which is, I think, a, a pretty good, positive deal for the City, and we did work through this, um, through the workshop. Uh, we are asking for a couple of uh, recommend, uh, recommended action items. First would be to repeal and replace the cable television franchise ordinance for Comcast. And then we need a second motion, which would approve the resolution authorizing publication of the ordinance by title and summary. And I don't know why exactly, but it does require four votes um, to, to publish the summary ordinance. Now it feels like the air's kicking on. Um, <laughs> um, we're all distracted a little bit by the heat tonight, I think. Yeah. Um, I wasn't intending to have Mr. Folds go through the report again unless you'd like to hear it again or have additional questions that might have come to mind. <laughs> so with that, then we need two motions okay. as recommended on page 111 of the staff. Page. Mayor, I move to repeal and replace <laughs> cable television franchise ordinance for Comcast. Moved by Smith, seconded by Juniman, a motion to repeal and replace the cable television franchise ordinance for Comcast. Is there any further discussion? I hope not. Okay. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Motion passes. May I further move to approve the resolution <laughs> authorizing publication of ordinance by title and summary, which will require four votes. Second. Moved by Smith, seconded by Juniman, a motion to approve the resolution authorizing publication of ordinance by title and summary. All those in uh, favor? I have a comment oh, first. You didn't ask if there was discussion? more discussion. Further Sorry. discussion. <laughs> well, if anybody missed our workshop, they can go back and see what the long discussion we had because we did, and we, got, we received a very thorough report, so we're not just running through this. We heard all the fine details from the attorney, so we don't need to go there again. And I just want to thank the staff, particularly Michael Folds, for working on this for all this time. Yeah. Staff did a very nice job on okay, it. Okay, now we can concur. vote. <laughs> okay, all those in favor? <laughs> Aye. Aye. The motion passes. Okay. Feels good in here. Okay, the next agenda item is to authorize the release of a request for proposal for residential curbside trash and recycling. Sean? Yep. Ms. Finwall, would you like to? Join us at the microphone. I think we should congratulate her on not melting before we got to her item. I know. Thank you, Madam Mayor, members of the council. Tonight we'll be discussing the trash and recycling request for proposal. So as you recall, the city council did authorize city staff to release a request for proposal or what we call an RFP for both of those contracts. Our current trash and recycling contract expired December 31st of 2019. And of course we have trash with Republic Services and recycling with Tennis Sanitation. The uh, competitive RFP process will allow the city to compare prices directly between respondents, allow competitive, uh, excuse me, allow for new or improved services, and provide an opportunity for the city to bundle its trash and recycling contracts if that alternative provides the highest value to Maplewood residents. And city staff did present to the council on April 22nd the RFP outline and uh, we had a few comments and made some modifications to that draft. And so tonight we have the full document here for you. I'm sure that was an easy read. Um, 
So I, I hope to outline that for you briefly and then answer any of your questions. We're talking trash. And tonight uh, we are looking to, um, for the City Council to approve the resolution which would authorize the release of the request for proposals for residential curbside trash and recycling and that would be with or without amendments from the Council here tonight. So briefly, I will touch on the, outline, uh, the proposal, excuse me, the RFP. So first of all, this big giant packet does include um, the RFP body, which kind of explains our current system and details some changes we'd like to see in that system. And then it also includes an actual trash contract and a, a draft recycling contract. And then the proposal forms that the trash hauling contractors would submit to the city with their proposals. The uh, RFP does outline three alternatives that are uh, the haulers can respond to. Alternative one would be bundled trash and recycling, so one contractor for both citywide trash and recycling. Alternate two would just be for trash only, and alternate three would be for recycling only. The term of the contract, that has modified slightly since we outlined this in April. So we are now calling out a five and a half year term of the contract, and that would allow the end of the contract to be June 31st of 2025, which is always a good time to roll out a new contract in the middle of the summer rather than the dead of the winter, which is what our current contract calls for. So that does always have some challenges. So we're calling out a five and a half year term mm -hmm. with a feasibility of extensions for that contract. And then I wanted to outline a few of the proposed changes from our existing contract. Uh, number one would be the contract would include formalizing the fall cleanup campaign and the spring cleanup. So that would be included in the contract with the trash hauler so that we don't have to go out each year um, getting bids for our contractors for that spring cleanup because as you mentioned earlier, it does take a lot of coordination so having one less worry and having that included in the bulk of the contract would be beneficial mm -hmm. to the city. Um, including buildings and park facilities. So currently under our recycling contract, Tennis does collect the recycling uh, at no <coughs> added charge as part of uh, the contract in all of our city facilities, including our parks. So we wanna make sure that that's also included in our trash contract. At the time that we had um, adopted the contract with Republic Services, we were under a current contract for our city facilities with waste management, so that was not an opportunity back then. Um, and this one is something that is quite innovative, and it's an approach to try to reduce the amount of trash and increase the amount of recycling. Now this is something that some cities do, but mainly cities that um, do their own billing. So here in Maplewood, uh, we are now proposing a pay-as-you-throw proposal for the trash hauling. Now that's something that we know would be new to our residents. Uh, currently it's a standardized fee with a small percentage. Uh, as an example, uh, from the 65 gallon to the 95 gallon, you only see maybe a dollar or two difference, which is only about 13% difference. So over time, over the term of the contract, we'd like to see eventually a 50% difference, which would then have residents, you know, opting in for the smaller sizes rather than the larger sizes because, you know, then it's something that you feel in your pocketbook and would be more opt to reduce the waste to save that money. So that pay as you throw, we know, would be something innovative and new to the residents, so we want to do that in increments over time, over the terms of the contract. The uh, current trash and recycling collection zones, right now we have five day certain collection zones. So uh, you might have a, a Wednesday route or a Friday route where your trash and recycling is collected. Uh, we have always had some challenges on our Friday routes with individuals wanting to go out of town, leaving, leaving their carts out, and then not having them come in until they return on Sunday. So we are looking for um, innovative approaches to reducing the collection zones down to four. So that's something we'd like to see from those proposals. Planning for curbside organics collection, so that's the next step in our 
solid waste management. Right now, Ramsey County does offer the drop-off sites for organics collections, and here in Maplewood, we'll have actually have a satellite site um, near our Maplewood Community Center where residents can drop off their organics. But the next step, of course, is the curbside collection. Ramsey County is working on a plan for that curbside collection, which they hope to, and, and I should say infrastructure, to ensure that uh, it's feasible having that rollout in year 2022, which of course is in the term of this contract. So we want to ensure that the proposals we receive have a plan for moving forward with that organics collection. And then on the recycling end, a couple new approaches would be the city of Maplewood owning the recycling carts. Right now the city owns the trash carts and that over the years um, has allowed a few uh, things and, and hopefully something we'll see in our new proposal for uh, trash hauling is uh, number one, the city purchased the carts um, to ensure kind of a even playing field for future proposals. So the smaller haulers are able to put in a proposal for our large city so that they don't have to roll out all of those carts. Um, it does keep the cost of the trash and now recycling fees low because, again, the contractor doesn't have to purchase those carts and amortize the cost of those carts in just that five and a half year term. So our current trash hauling carts, we paid for over a seven year period through a utility bond and those will be paid off uh, this year actually. So the city is looking for the recycling cart purchase. And finally, the most benefit uh, the city could receive is through a grant through Ramsey County. Right now they are offering 50% of the cost of the carts. So that right now to the city of Maplewood, if we were to purchase um, the whatever it is, about 12,000 carts at approximately $55 per cart, looking at approximately $660,000 for our residential carts, getting a grant for 30%, that's $330,000 to the city of Maplewood. So that's really something that we should look at. They are also um, receptive to covering, uh, you know, 50%, I should say, a certain percentage of the cost of the recycling um, dumpsters that we're looking at. Right now with our multifamily units, mm -hmm. um, we only allow or offer the carts. So that's been a challenge in some of our larger apartment complexes mm -hmm. that now have, uh, you'll see trash and recycling rooms on each floor where residents can put the items down the chute and then it goes down into a large dumpster. Well, right now we don't have the infrastructure set up so that those dumpsters can be collected uh, by our current city um, recycling program. So we want to offer up those um, carts to, you know, we estimate there might be 10 uh, apartment complexes that would benefit from that. So again, that grant would cover a cost of those dumpster enclosures for the recycling. Finally, uh, no, excuse me, a few more things on the recycling, an option to uh, do the billing for the recycling. So right now, under the trash contract, Republic Services does the billing and the city of Maplewood does the billing for our recycling. We charge that fee on our uh, residents' water bill, and St. Paul Regional Water Services does charge the city 13 cents, I think it is, uh, for each bill that they send out. That's approximately $50,000 a year to the city just for them doing the billing. So if we had the trash and recycling contract bundled, this opportunity would be available for the contractor to do the billing for that recycling. So that's something we'd like to look at as well. And then finally on the recycling, well, I had mentioned, um, multifamily recycling dumpsters instead of the carts. So I think that's a real uh, big and new innovative approach to our recycling program, allowing for additional recycling at our multifamily units. And those have always throughout the years been a challenge, is uh, trying to uh, get the multifamily unit um, recycling rates up. So with that, um, I wanted to outline that um, the City Council during that April 22nd workshop did um, review the proposal review committee and we had, you had appointed two council members, a council member Juniman and Knutson, to serve on this proposal review committee. We There'll also be three trash. environmental and natural resources commissioners, two city staff, and then uh, one county staff, and then fourth infrastructure and environment, who is the county's solid waste consultant, will do the um, financial feasibility for the city. And um, we'll look at uh, evaluation criteria based on um, 
in the staff report it has seven, but actually there's six that's called out in the RFP. I apologize for that confusion. But these evaluation criteria are actually based off of the criteria the city used when we organized our trash hauling in 2011 and, and put out that RFP. Number one would be economics, making sure that we're getting a good price point for our residents for both trash and recycling. Number two would be proposal content and overall responsiveness. We know that some haulers will be presenting some innovative approaches, so we want to look at that and offer um, you know, higher points for that type of uh, proposal. Safety is a huge issue. Education, how the haulers will help the city educate our residents on uh, reducing waste and increasing recycling. Uh, environmental impacts, you know, are they using um, certain types of fuels that uh, would lessen um, greenhouse gas emissions, uh, things of that nature, and then their qualifications. And the next step in this RFP process, because we are on that tight schedule, um, because of course those contracts do end the end of this year, and we do want to give the haulers time uh, to, number one, put in an ad um, an appropriate proposal. Number two, give them time uh, once we negotiate the contract to uh, prepare for rolling out of the contract. So we hope to release the actual RFP on May 20th. That's in one week. So after your review and any amendments that you might have to make or are requesting. And then I should point out in this large document, there were a few little items that we still need to research and you'll see those kind of highlighted in yellow. Yep. One example is at the time this was released, we didn't have uh, exact numbers on the number of carts that were out at our city facilities. So we want to detail all that uh, clearly so that uh, when the haulers do put in a proposal, they know what they're, of course, proposing on. So there's just a small amount of detail that will need to be um, um, brought up to speed on, on the RFP prior to that May 20th date and then any amendments you might have. And then the proposals will be due one month from then, four weeks, June 17th. So that is a, a quick turnaround. And again, those contracts or contract rolling out January 1st of 2020. So with that, I know it was a very large document, and um, yes. but I've read it all several times. <laughs> So, <laughs> any questions you might have, I've got the answer. Thank you. Thank you for that excellent report. Councilmember Juneman. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I looked, but I maybe I dozed off at some point. You know, you like you said, it was a little <laughs> thick. Um, with the confusion that we've had a, a few times on holidays, or like when we had the snow problem, where the trash company delayed the pickup and recycling didn't. Do we have it in here that no matter who's doing what, they have to do the same amount of notification? I couldn't find it, but that doesn't mean it's not in here. <laughs> but I do think we have to be very specific because it was confusing. Yes, thank you, Madam Mayor and uh, Council Member Juneman. Uh, so you're correct. Uh, there were a few occasions too, actually, where um, the trash hauling company had to delay service because of the weather, but the recycling company didn't. So the trash company sent out a robocall to all of our residents indicating that the trash was delayed and may have even mentioned recycling. Yes, that, that's kind of my point. Um, we need to somehow get it in here that if it's two different companies, they coordinate, and if and even if it's one company, make sure you notify everyone because some people didn't get the robocall on one of those occasions. I don't know what happened. It was probably very last minute, but whatever. I think there has to be a way to cover that in here. Um, you know, we're now, we're, this isn't <laughs> 10 years ago or, or even seven years ago. We don't, we're down to the more fine points now. Um, if someone chooses to do the recycling contract separately once again, is there an option for us to say they must also bill direct instead of us having the water department to it? Uh, well, first on the communications piece, uh, in, in the contract we do spell out um, better communication okay. between the contractors if it is uh, dual contracts, right. and, and that was a challenge. Yeah. Um, and then on requiring that the recycler do the billing mm -hmm. if it's just a recycling contract, uh, so that's a little more challenging. Um, I know why we did it this time because they weren't coinciding. But say we get two proposals and one of the 
the recycling proposal outside of the bundle is better than the one that's bundled with trash. Is there some way we can say, well, the trash company is going <laughs> to build themselves now. Can you build yourself? Right. Um, at least yes, that's certainly something we can look at. I think with the recycling, however. I know there's a cost factor. Well, we are proposing um, just a standardized one fee for any size cart yeah. is uh, the current proposal. So um, with the city doing the billing, currently uh, Tennis Sanitation charges the city $2.86 per household per month, and the city turns around and charges the residents $3.54 per household per month uh, to cover uh, our costs for our recycling program. Right. So um, ensuring that if the recycler does the billing, that um, the city's allowed to set the overall fee. Right, right. That's kind of why I asked I see. if we could do it. I knew, I know we'd have to, it'd be a little more complicated, but if it would simplify it for us as a city, it's something we could at least explore. That's all I'm asking. And then in that uh, instance, if uh, the city did set the fee slightly higher than the contract, uh, the recycling company would then reimburse the city, similar to what we do in our uh, trash cart fees right. that are right. uh, taken in by the trash hauler and then reimbursed to the city to pay for the trash carts. Yeah, yeah. And then I have one comment just for people who are new to this. Well, I guess you're all new to this, <laughs> except me, the old, old trash lady. Um, one of the reasons we chose to buy the carts, as I've said before, is that it simplifies the process if you change vendors. Because everybody has a cart in their garage, and it doesn't matter who's going to pick it up, it's there. Um, and so doing that with recycling would also make a lot of sense. And people got a little, their wires a little crossed when we first did this, and saying, well, when the, when the recycler does it, he doesn't, we don't pay for a cart. Oh, yes, you do. <laughs> the recycling charge is decidedly higher than it <laughs> would be if we were supplying the carts. So, and our charge for carts is cheaper than a vendor's charge to you for carts would be. So that's the advantage of owning carts. It simplifies the process, and it's actually more transparent about what things actually cost. So Thank that's you. what I know. Thank you. Councilmember Smith. Just, uh, uh, Ms. Fennell, I want to get some clarification around these billing charges from the water service. So of that uh, incremental charge you have above and beyond the standard tennis charge, does that capture, does that reimburse us essentially for the what we pay the water department? Is that included in that $1.50 or whatever it is? Or is that an incremental charge on top of that? It Either one. <laughs> It captures the fee, yes. It does capture the fee. Because I think to some degree, I would prefer to not write a check for $2.86 if I can avoid it. I mean, that's a, it, there is a convenience aspect to that. And I think, you know, when I look at this, yeah, uh, I think when I look at this contract, I look at a combination of, of, of certainly low cost, which has been something we've been really good at, as well as just making it super easy for people. Mm -hmm. And that's also something I think we've been pretty good at. Um, you know, so uh, I think as we, as we consider, and I think it's totally worthwhile and smart to look into every option as Councilmember Juneman proposes, but I think we need to balance out, you know, is it easier for residents at a relatively low cost when I think about what it costs my company to process a bill, it's obscene. Um, so I, you know, I think Let's balance all that out as we look at it. Uh, very good point. So um, we, of course, required the trash hauling company to do the billing because we don't have utility billing. And right. um, with the trash hauling, residents can have one of four different sizes. Right. And, you know, they could be changing. So it would be very challenging to try to get St. Paul Regional Water to charge different fees, you know, different My months. My comments are specific to recycling. Right. So yeah. very good point. With the recycling, now you'd have a third bill to pay. Plus, and they are already doing Council that. members, can we wait and go through the, yeah, it, that way it makes it much easier. Um, I have another, were we done with, with what you had wanted to say? I have another question. Uh, I wanted a little bit more information about the grant for the recycling carts. Uh, it says that we have, uh, we've applied, we're in the process of, you know, requesting a grant 
Uh, what does that timeline look like? Because I know grants are not automatic. And so what is the timeline on this particular grant that would pay 50% of the cards? So we've been uh, in discussions with Ramsey County and uh, they're full aware of our uh, request. And um, the, the funding was originally just for carts, but right. again, Maplewood um, now is approaching it with uh, dumpsters. So they've done some research and decided that they will cover a percentage of the dumpsters based on the cost of the carts. So, well, to answer your, your question directly, um, you know, it would just be a few weeks before they have the official reviews. Um, it's not a written proposal that's been submitted yet. It's just been discussions back and forth. Because, uh, I mean, we're kind of putting all of our eggs in one basket, aren't we, in that we may not get that grant. Uh. Uh, I mean, maybe we will, but maybe we won't. And what if we don't? Then that's an additional 330000 that we're looking at paying. So can you respond? And I'm going to have, I'll talk to Councilmember Judeman can talk in just a minute, but I want to hear what you have to say about that. I mean, do we know that we're going to get that grant? I say the likelihood is very high. Okay. Um, you know, we are um, releasing the RFP on May 20th. Uh, we have a month where we'll receive those proposals, and in that time frame, we'll be uh, working closely on the CART purchase. So, um, Ramsey County, of course, is uh, supportive of cities purchasing CARTs. Um, they paid for uh, the CARTs in St. Paul recently. Maplewood was actually the first city that um, had requested. Ramsey County cover the cost of the carts back in 2000 and uh, maybe 13 or 14 when the city was proposing to purchase recycling carts uh, back then. But the city council at the time opted to have the recycler roll out the carts. So at any rate, um, the, source. the likelihood is very high that the city of Maplewood would receive a grant for the purchase of carts. Okay. I just want to make sure that it's looking like that, uh, that we might not we may be moving forward with a different set of facts if we don't get that grant. Okay. I also have a question, and this is just in your summary part of it. Um, on page 168 of 300, uh, 4A1, you mentioned trash contractor would continue to do the billing and most administrative customer services related to residents' orders. You know, I looked at that and then I looked in the contract to see what is the delineation that they will do most of the administrative services because most could be subject to a lot of different interpretations. Your interpretation and then whoever would be doing the, the trash collection, what does that mean? What does that entail? And are we adequately covered in terms of the RFP? I just want to make it clear that people know what's going to be expected. Yeah, we should outline that language, I think, a little bit more clear. But as intended currently, and uh, it has been happening over the seven years, is that the trash and recycling contractor take in all the customer calls, complaints, cart switches, things like that. But when you have a city, two contractors, you know, there's, sometimes there's confusion. So if someone doesn't know who to call, so I'll get a right, call. Right, but this is only about trash, so... Yeah, but people calling. I think it's yeah. called out in the recycling as well. Mm -hmm. um, uh, contract. It's not, it's not specifically no, okay. called out. Well, we're going to modify that language, but I think it currently, should be spelled out. Yes, thank you. Currently, it's uh, on occasion a city will take a call. You know. Other than calls, what other administrative customer service issues are envisioned with that? Uh, with the trash hauler handling, uh -huh. uh, well, the billing, um, the. Uh, switch of the carts, the, um, they'll manage the carts. Uh, if there's warranty issues, if a cart's broken, uh, administrative, uh, uh, they'll have to submit reports to the city annually. We, we, we take in the uh, annual report and then the monthly reports uh, that identify the number of carts that are out there. So there's a host of administrative responsibilities um, surrounding that and I th and we do call out those those uh, reports in that contract as well it's something that uh, we have been doing for the last seven years and it's it's been uh, very beneficial to just be able to 
look um, at the reports, you know, because they're updated monthly. So that's part of their administrative duties as well. Okay. I think that that is a really important thing for the council to get that report on an annual basis. I know I appreciate it. So I'd really like, appreciate that continuing. Uh, Councilmember Juneman. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, in regards to that grant, um, you know, nothing is cast in stone ever, but it is highly likely because we are absolutely, we are leaders even in the county in all of our green initiatives, but particularly in our recycling and trash programs. Other cities are struggling to even get it on their agendas. <laughs> I won't mention any names, but there's one not too far west. Um, so I think they look at us as we know what we're getting into, we know what we're doing. They look at our, our trash cart ownership and see that that was a responsible thing to do and they're using it as a model. So I do think it's highly likely. I certainly hope so. That would be really wonderful for now, our I city. grant you that it does involve the county board ultimately, so you know, there's that, but whatever. We are, we are in recycling and trash collection. We are regarded as people who know what we're doing and we got out there and did it. Council members, do I have a motion? It's on page 166 of 300. I move to authorize the release of a request for proposal for residential curbside trash and recycling. Do you have a second? Second. Moved by Juniman, seconded by Knudsen to authorize the release of a request for proposal for residential curbside trash and recycling. Any further discussion? Mm. Councilmember Juniman. Thank you. I just want to thank Sean for the immense amount of work this is. She did the one way back in 10 and 11 and didn't leave us screaming and kicking. I'm not sure why. But um, she has kept such careful track of what we should be moving forward with now, adding in what worked, what we need to ask for again. Um, it's phenomenal. Her attention to detail and her ability to do this is phenomenal. So I thank her for all of her efforts. Your efforts are appreciated. Uh, any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Motion passes. Thank you. And we have one more item on our agenda Issue. tonight. City we do. Manager Coleman, do you want to tee that up for us, please? Certainly, Mayor. Uh, Mayor Abrams, members of the City Council, uh, tonight we have asked uh, the Council to go into closed session to look at a purchase offer for city owned property at 2501 London Lane East. Uh, before the meeting is closed, the council must state on the record the specific grounds permitting the meeting to be closed and describe the subject to be discussed. Uh, therefore, it is recommended that you introduce the motion as outlined on uh, your uh, packet staff report, page 298. So, Mayor, we do need a motion to close the meeting, go into closed session. I hereby move, pursuant to Minnesota statute section 13D.05 subdivision 3C, to close the regular meeting, go into closed session to consider purchase offer for the city owned property located at 2501 London Lane East. Is there a second? Second. Moved by Juniman, seconded by Smith uh, to go to a closed session to consider purchase offer for city owned property located at 2501 London Lane East. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Motion passes, and we will close this meeting, and we will go into a closed session. Now, I th think you have to give the time and who's going to be there, right? Uh, we usually do that when we get inside about who's... I thought she had to do it here. He usually tells who's going to go. Mr. Beatty, do we need to put the time on right now? Okay. 9-10. There you go. And then we'll go into closed session.
We're going to come back to order uh, from our closed meeting. It is 9.34. Uh, Mr. Beatty, would you like to give us a summary, please? Yes, uh, Madam Mayor Council, we have met uh, in closed session to discuss uh, offers and counter offers on the property that's identified in the uh, packet and uh, you've given staff direction and we will proceed accordingly. And with that council members, we are concluded and I will adjourn the meeting. Thank you and good night.